We're going to open with John and John 11. Will be our text. John 11. <coughs> And we come to this passage, and it's the only time Lazarus is being raised from the dead. It's the only place in Scripture where it's where it's uh, captured in, in all the Gospels. It's the only place where it, where it's recorded is in the Gospel of John. And so public and undeniable this miracle is that when you look at it, it seems to be the actual catalyst that would cause the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees to take counsel to deliberate putting Christ to death. It was this very miracle that caused them to say, we've got to put this man to death. And we know, I know this because in John 11, verse 46, at the end of the chapter, it says, Some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and Pharisees a council and said, What do we do? For this man doeth many miracles. We let him thus alone. All men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. This spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. Not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Because this is what Christ's death would accomplish, the gathering of his people to himself. So from that day forth they took counsel together for to put him to death. So that in giving life to Lazarus, Raising Lazarus from the dead, it spelled the death of Christ. This is this was it. When he raised Lazarus from the dead, it was determined that he was now going to die. Right? And this is the testimony of Scripture. In Hebrews 2, 9 through 13, we read, We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man, and that every man being those from every tongue, tribe, and nation whom Christ represented and died for, not for the Jews only, but also for the Gentiles. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, and bring many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So, in this miracle, we behold that truth that is so precious to us, substitution. That Christ died as our substitute, right? Because in giving life to Lazarus and raising him from the dead, it spelled his sentence of death in the minds of the Jews there. So I titled this message, The Miracle of Life and Death. The Miracle of Life and Death. Now, when I looked at John 11, I see five sections. We just read the last, the fifth section there at the end. But Christ speaks to, to four different groups of people. He speaks to his disciples first. And then we see him speaking to Martha. And then we see him speaking to Mary. And then we finally see him speak to Lazarus. So we'll look at these, these four divisions. They'll be our divisions for the text. And it's a picture of our salvation in Christ. So when Christ raises Lazarus from the dead, that's more of a picture of how the Lord raises us from our spiritual death and gives us life in himself more so than it is a picture of our resurrection that we'll receive one day uh, when the Lord raises us from the grave. So in raising Lazarus, it's more of a picture of how the Lord saves his people in giving them spiritual life because we're all born, we all come forth dead in trespasses and sins. All right, so let's look in John chapter 11, verse 1. This is Christ speaking to his disciples. Now, a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. And it was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto 
Christ, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. And when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. So that Lazarus was going to die, but he wasn't going to remain, die, remain dead. Christ would raise him from the dead. But what's important here, again, is that this would produce that utter contempt of the Pharisees when Christ works this miracle in raising Lazarus from the dead. Right? He said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. And Christ was glorified in his death as he prayed that high priestly prayer in John 17 when Christ spake these words lifting his eyes up to heaven and said Father the hour has come glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee so this miracle would lead to the glorification of the Lord Jesus Christ in his own crucifixion there on the cross when he would come and do that work which God sent him to do now, back in our text, John 11, 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. So that in delaying his coming there, it, there would be absolutely no doubt that Lazarus was really, really dead. By the time Christ would get there, he would be stinking because his body, his flesh, would be rotting off his bones. So... The thing is, is that just like Lazarus, and I can't emphasize this enough, that's us in our fleshly nature. That's how we come forth, dead and corrupt and stinking to our God. We're just like Lazarus here lying in the grave. This is our, this is our flesh, this is us in our flesh, this is us in our works. The best that we can do, it stinks to God. It's corrupt. Our works are corrupt. Anything that we touch is corrupt. It doesn't produce anything uh, that is good or pleasing to the Lord. So just like Lazarus can't save himself, neither can we save ourselves. Just as Lazarus can't do anything to ask or seek the Lord to do some work or miracle of grace for him, so we too, uh, without the, the work, before the, the, the moving of the Spirit upon us, we don't seek the Lord. We have no desire for the Lord. We're shut up in darkness. We're shut up in the tomb of death. And we have no desire for the Lord and we don't seek Him and we don't cry out to Him for help. We might cry out to, to God, the God of our imagination, but it's not the true and living God until the true and living God first comes to us and gives us life in Himself. In Romans 8, 5 it says, They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Now, there's uh, some here and there's certainly many in the world who aren't so sure about Christ. They don't know what they think of Christ. He's not their Lord, so they think. They don't claim him as their Lord. They don't call him God. They don't even know if he's the Savior or if he ever even really existed. They doubt whether God exists. They don't know these things. And all they think of are they're minding the things of the flesh. That's all that they think of and all that they put their minds or set their minds on. They think of their jobs. They think of their homes. They think of their friends and what they're going to do and when they're going to meet up with their friends. They think of how they might entertain themselves and what movie they're going to see, what TV shows they're going to watch. And we do those things too. But that's all that the carnal man thinks of. That's all that the carnal mind dwells on. That's all that the carnal mind is interested in. The carnal mind doesn't think of the Lord and who they are and what they are before the Lord and how the Lord deals with his people how the Lord saves his people. It's all they ever think of. They mind the things of the flesh. There's no thought of Christ. And to be carnally minded like that is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, that is the law of faith, neither indeed can be, because it's flesh. The flesh hates God. That's the testimony of Scripture. You might think, well, I don't think I hate God. Yes, you do. In the flesh, you hate God. Every one of us, I hate God, you hate God. In the flesh, until the Lord rises and gives us the new man. And in the new man, we love the Lord and we delight in the Lord. The flesh continues to be rotten and stinking and lusting after the things that the flesh lusts for. That doesn't change. 
not, not on this side of, of glory. It's in the new man that we delight now in the Lord. But those that are passed by the Lord, the, those that have no spiritual life, they don't have the new man. All they have is the flesh. And there's nothing good in the flesh. There's nothing that the flesh desires of from the Lord. So it says there in Romans 8, 8, they that so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And even we, when walking in the flesh, not in the spirit, just minding the things of the flesh, we're not even pleasing the Lord. But in Christ, in Christ, in the new man, we are pleasing the Lord. Always the Lord has, has accomplished our salvation. Now John 11 says, And after that saith he to his disciples, Let us go into Judea. And his disciples said, And Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee. Goest thou thither again? And the occasion that he's referring to is in John 8 and John 10, the crime being that he made himself equal with God. Amen. Because you, know, you, don't, you don't get any higher than God. You either are God or you're not God. And he made himself equal with God. And our Lord answers the disciples in a peculiar way. He says in verse 9, John 11, 9, Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. And Christ is saying, I've done nothing wrong. I've got no reason to hide out in the darkness and to scurry behind in dark places. All I've done is speak the truth. And if I hide myself away, Christ is saying, what shall they who dwell in darkness do? For Christ himself is the light of men. And we need to see Christ. And we need to know him. And he needs to reveal himself to us that we might know him. That we might be called and brought out of the darkness of the kingdom that we're under, left in this flesh. So Christ must go out into the light. He must do this very work. Because again, he knows that this is going to lead to his glory it's going to lead to our good and our salvation. If he tries to hide away and protect his life, we all die. But if he gives up his life and goes out into the light and reveals himself as the light of men, then we who hope in him have hope and have life in the Lord Jesus Christ. As John 1, 4 through 5 says, In him was light, and the light was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Verse 18, no man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So Christ must go forth and do this miracle as it will be the catalyst for his being, um, for those, the chief priest finally saying, this is it, we've had enough, this man must be put to death, so that they would do that very thing that would lead to his glory, and ultimately our glory in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in John 11, 11, these things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may wake him out of sleep. And that's exactly what every sinner needs, is to be woken out of the sleep of our death of nature. Christ must come to us and give us life from the dead. As Psalm 65, 4 says, Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causes to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts, we shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. That holy temple that we are satisfied with is the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we now worship holy God, by whom now we are accepted to come before the throne of God and worship Him. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our temple. He is our hope. He is the reason why we can approach unto holy God. John eleven twelve. And said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And we need to hear and understand that we are dead, just like Lazarus. There's, you know, we, we move around, we think, well, I'm not, you know, we, we probably know somebody who's died, people that have passed away, and we think, well, I'm not as bad off as they are. They're, they're dead in the grave. The reality is, we're no different. We're not better off than they are. We're dead in trespasses and sins. We are dead, and we, must, we need to hear the voice of the Son of God declare that to us in our hearts and understand that 
we can produce no good thing. We are dead, dead, dead in trespasses and in sins. And we need the power of Christ, the glory of Christ to give us life, to wake us up out of our sleep, to wake us up out of our death by nature and give us life in himself. And Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And there is none accepted in that. John 11.15 now. And I am glad, Christ said, for your sakes that I was not there, with the intent that ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. And I see these words as actually gracious words. Thomas had been listening to what his Lord had said many times before, where Christ said, If any man will come unto me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Right? That's a fruit born of the Spirit and the child of God, that willingness to sacrifice their life, to lay down their life for their brethren, for the Lord, and to do that which he bids them to do, to lay down their life, to take up that cross, and lay down their lives. For whosoever will save his life, right? You say, I don't know that I want to make sacrifices for the Lord and sacrifices for the Lord's people. Whosoever will save his life uh, shall lose his life. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save. So it's completely contrary to the flesh because the flesh is always looking out for itself. Right? I mean, if I'm being honest with you, my flesh is looking out for me. I'm thinking of things and always tempted to think, well, wait a minute, if I don't do this, who's going to do it for me? But to remember that we're the Lord's, and that the Lord provides for his people, and he takes care of his people, and there's nothing that we can do that the Lord is going to be outdone by us, that he can't do for us. And we know, we who know the Lord, have experienced his grace, his comfort, know that every time we just trusted the Lord and did that which he was calling us to do and moving us to do, did we ever suffer wrong? Did we ever come out short? No, not, not at all. Maybe the flesh wanted some other thing and didn't get it, but in the new man, you were made to rejoice in Christ and be settled in him and to be glad in Christ because it drew you near to him and bless your heart in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Lord knows his people, and he knows how to save his people, and how to stir up their heart and, and cause them to follow him. All right, now, let's look at our second point. Christ speaks to Martha. In John eleven seventeen. 17. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had been, that Lazarus had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh to Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off, which is like two miles. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Now, Christ is speaking of raising Lazarus physically, but Martha, uh, not understanding exactly what he means, he replies in verse 24, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So she does believe, and it does demonstrate that she has faith and trust God, but she doesn't know all things, in the same way that we don't know all things. And so the Lord teaches us and grows us in grace and in the knowledge of our Savior and what he does for us, what he does for his people. Verse 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And what we see in this is that the Lord teaches us that he is the Lord, that he is the Son of God. He's not a pattern of good works. He's not a good man. He's not a prophet that we should follow and try and uh, pattern our lives after him. Christ is the Son of God. He is very God. And as God, he has life in himself, for he is life. He is the one who gives life 
to every man. Now, turn over to John 6. John 6 and verse 39. John 6, 39, And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now here is where all men and women get offended in Christ. That's what we do in our nature. We get offended. We grow tired and weary of hearing the words of Christ and what he says, because our flesh doesn't understand it, we don't get it, and what we do understand, we hate, and it repulses us, because we are very enmity against God. We're not en enemies with God, or, or against God, we are enmity against God. We don't, we do not, like God, we hate him, and the Lord hates our flesh. It has, there is no fellowship there. And it says, the Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? All they saw was just another man like unto themselves. Just another man. Nothing, nothing impressive about him. Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. I will raise him up at the last days, at the last day. The Jews understood what Christ was saying about himself. But do you who hear me now, do you understand what Christ is saying? That you and me, we're dead sinners, unable to save ourselves, unable to do a work for ourselves, unable to bring ourselves to Christ, unable to bring ourselves to be pleasing to the Lord. We need a Savior. We need a substitute. And Christ is that very substitute whom the Father sent into the world to lay down his life, to shed his blood, and put away the sins of his people. So you who are looking to your own works to make yourselves acceptable with God, stop. Because God doesn't call us to make ourselves accepted with him. He gave the law to show us that we can't make ourselves acceptable with God. The law was given to shut our mouths so that we can see, I can't do this. I can't make myself easy to the Lord. I need the Lord's grace and the Lord's mercy. And that's where we see the Lord Jesus Christ, who was made like unto us at the seed of Abraham and fulfilled all righteousness. And he did that work which we could never do for ourselves in fulfilling all righteousness, in fulfilling the prophets, in fulfilling uh, Moses. Uh, what was written in Moses' law and fulfilling the Psalms, Christ did it all because we can't do it. And so he laid down his life a perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world, the sins of his people who hope and trust in him. And the Lord himself must do this work for us to bring us to see our need of him. It's written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father, cometh unto me. So the Lord will teach his people this. He doesn't leave them in darkness. He's going to teach them. He's going to bring them to himself. When it pleases him, as it pleases him, whatever means he brings us through, whatever trials or tribulations to come to the end of ourselves, the Lord will do it. And the flesh may hate it, the flesh may not like it at all, but the Lord does what, what is good and profitable for his people. Even Look at, look at Lazarus, how he used Lazarus in this life. He allowed Lazarus to die, corrupt, go into the grave, all to bring about this, this miracle, not just of life, because Lazarus would die again, but to bring about the, the death of Christ. And, I mean, wow, what a, I just thought of that. I mean, what a, what, a, what a way to be used of the Lord, that you would actually go to the point of death and be brought back to life by the Lord Jesus Christ, all to show us this picture of how the Lord saves his people to be a testimony in that way. Romans 9.15 says, He saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it's not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. So the child of God will be brought to see 
Lord, you're merciful to whom you will be merciful. Lord, you who are merciful to me, an undeserving sinner. We're going to know what we are. We're not going to be left to cling and hang on to our self-righteousness and Christ and go before the throne of God and think that we're going to enter into heaven. The Lord is going to strip us of all that. He's going to take that away so that we don't hope in those things, but that our hope is left in one. Lord Jesus Christ. Right? That way is narrow. It's as narrow as Christ. You're not getting in shoulder to shoulder with Christ. You're going in through Christ. That's the only way to God the Father. Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. All right. Now, third, Christ speaks to Mary. John 11, 28. When Martha had so said, she went her way and called Mary her sister secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. Verse 29. As soon as she had heard that, she rose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house, and comforted her when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then, when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. And when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? And they said unto him, Lord, come and see. Now these are the first words that we have recorded by John when he was with Mary, and these are the first things he said to her or in her presence. And he asks, where have you laid him? And, you know, we put away that which is dead, right? We hide it, we bury it. We bury it away in darkness, in a cave, or in the ground. We hide it. And our sin and our iniquity is called death in the scripture. And so, naturally, we hide it. We bury it away in darkness. We don't want people to see or know because we don't want to be judged and we don't want to hear that this is wrong. We want to be able to do and justify what we do. We don't want to be out and plain before everyone to see because, you know, once once you say the thing out loud, it's pretty obvious that it, it's, it's wrong usually. Um, you, you see it. So we treat our sin like a dead body and we, we bury it. We, we put it out of the way. But Christ declares our love of sin to us. And he shows it plainly what we are by nature. He shows us what we're doing, how we're hiding our sin, how we're trying to, to, to prevent the Lord from seeing it, like we protect it, like it's some precious thing to us. And our Lord said to Nicodemus in John 3, 19, He said, This is the condemnation that light, the light is the Lord Jesus Christ, light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. And, you know, we see that very behavior of hiding from the Lord and hiding our sin in our first parents, Adam and Eve, right? When they were in the garden, what did they do? But they ran off, and their eyes were open. They ran off, and they hid themselves, right? They knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the pool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. You know, it's interesting how for a moment they thought their fig leaves were sufficient to cover them. But as soon as they heard the voice of God, they recognized that these things are not a sufficient covering for us, and they ran off deeper into the woods. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And so Christ, like that, says, Where have you laid matters? Where have you put them? Where have you put them away? And we're all just like Lazarus. And the Lord is the one who comes and seeks us out. Where have you laid the body? Where are you? Where are you? When he, we hear his voice, with power and authority, he breaks open that, that dead, hard, cold, stony heart. And finally, we're brought and, and, and 
we're wilted and, and brought to nothing in ourselves and that proud, arrogant spirit that we have by nature is broken and we see that we're in darkness and that we love that darkness and we see our need of Christ that, and that, Christ, that God has provided a sufficient and perfect full sacrifice in His Son, Jesus Christ. The Lord does that. No man can do it. I can't do it. My words are, are nothing. But the Lord can take his gospel, his word, and take the blood of Christ and apply it to our hearts and cover our guilty conscience and wash us of our sins, wash us of our guilt and our corruption so that we're broken and we say, Lord, you did this. Everything you did in bringing me here to this point was all your work. And it was on purpose. And it was it is good for me to be here. And it's good that you brought me here to this. And although my flesh has been broken and hates it, it's good. You know, I heard I heard my dad having a conversation the other day. Um, I think most of you know that he is uh, battling cancer and it's uh, basically gone now. But I heard him say on the phone to somebody, no, it was good. It was good. It was a blessing that I had this cancer because it brought him to see that he's nothing, that he has no strength, and that he needs the Lord Jesus Christ. So, the Lord is able to take our afflictions, to bring us to the end of ourselves, to break us of our proud, stony heart, and show us our need of the Lord Jesus Christ. So not even nature's death and darkness can hide us from Christ. When He comes seeking us, He's going to find us, and He'll deal with us in a way that we'll hear His voice, we'll hear His word. He seeks out His own sheep. You now He came to Zacchaeus, and He said to him as He was going by, Zacchaeus is up in a tree, and He said, this day is salvation come to thy house, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. And so here we see Christ coming to seek out Lazarus in the way that he seeks us out, in the way in darkness and in sin. He brings us out of that death. Now in John 11:35, we see, I think the shortest verse in all the Bible, Jesus wept. And though it's a short verse, it says as much as any other verse, for it shows and communicates the love of Christ that he has for his people and the empathy and the care that he shows to us. And he's very tender with us. God isn't harsh. With those that are harsh, God will be harsh. And with those that are forward, God will show himself to be forward. I think that's in Psalm 18. And, but with those that are broken and tender and of a contrite spirit, and he's broken and made tender and contrite, he shows himself very tender, and very loving, and very kind to us. And Jesus wept, and the Jews seeing that said, Behold how he loved. Now turn to 1 John 4, 9 and 10. First John 4, 9 and 10. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Here in His love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us, and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So Christ's love is a love of purpose. He's not, his love isn't meaningless like the many so-called churches all around us where they speak of the love of God. It sounds nice, but it's an ineffectual love. It doesn't do anything for anyone. It's as if, you know, you, you have love for your grandchild and you see them running out to the street and you say, well, I'm going to have to just let him. I'll call him. But if he doesn't answer me, there's nothing I can do because I love him and I'm not going to offend his will and his, you know, what he wants to do. I'm going to let him do what he wants to do. That's not love. Let him run into the street and, and get hit by a car isn't love. But you're going to go out there and you're going to prevent him and stop him and turn him from his pursuit of running off into the street because he doesn't know that his end is death. So our Savior's love is like that. It's, it's powerful. It quickens us. It turns us from our pursuit of death and brings us to himself. It's an effectual love. All right, now. Let's look at our last, our last point. Christ speaks to Lazarus. John 11, 37. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? 
Jesus therefore again groaning in himself cometh to the grave. And it was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Again, another good picture of our hard heart, which has just, it's just a stone laying on it. We can't hear, we're in darkness, shut up to the things of God. Verse 39, Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he, for he hath been dead four days. And so it is with us, by nature, we stink to the Lord God, having no righteousness and no holiness of our own. But the Lord must give us a new heart, and that he does, just like he said in Ezekiel 36, 26, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. All right, John 11, 40. Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? And we can only hear the voice of Christ and believe what Christ says if we're born again by his spirit. The spirit must regenerate us, making us alive in the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now in John eleven forty one, then they took away the stone from the place where the where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And the Lord's not again not going to leave us in the dark. He's going to, it pleases the Father to teach us. As Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation and belief of yeah, sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the attaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to know him. And when he had thus spoken, cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And so it is with us all on the day of his truth. The Lord will call us out of our darkness, out of our death, out of that grave, out of that, that stinking corruption that we are by nature. He will call us from that grave to life himself. And so we read of Lazarus, the dead came forth, Verse 44, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. And Jesus saith unto him, Loose him and let him go. And again, another picture of how the Lord grows us in the grace and knowledge of our Savior, Jesus Christ. As we come forth, being awakened by him, having grave clothes, having a napkin about our face so that we don't see him. Our movements are restricted. We don't understand things very well. But the Lord, through that gospel, strips away those grave clothes, taking them off, teaching us over time. And don't be upset and angry and be quick to be angry with your brethren. Should they know better? Perhaps, you know, when they offend you. But be patient with one another. Love one another. Pray for one another. Before you say anything, pray about it. Maybe the Lord will turn your heart prevent you from saying something else and offending one another even more. But we all have grave clothes and we say things foolishly and sometimes even, you know, we don't say things the way they should be said even concerning the gospel or the Lord, but be patient with one another. Trust that the Lord has gathered his people here for a reason, that he'll teach them in his time, he'll teach them and those vain things of religion and the foolish things that we say, the Lord will remove them. Take them off. You know, I've heard of people going into the services and wearing crosses around their necks for a time, and no one had to say anything. They just sat there listening to the gospel, hearing a faithful preacher preach the pastor preach that gospel, and the Lord taught them. And they removed that cross and never wore it again. You know, but nobody had to say anything. So be patient with one another in that way. The Lord knows how to teach us, instruct us, and grow us. They're coming to hear the gospel. And what more could you want? What more can you say, you know, out in the parking lot? That's going to be more effective than, than hearing the gospel. It's the same way the Lord taught, taught you and me, right? It was, it was him teaching us, not 
not another man telling us what we need to do and stop doing and things like that. So when many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. They'll see what the Lord does. So my time is out, but basically, you know, the Lord, we need to hear the Lord's voice. The Lord needs to call us out of darkness into his marvelous light. He does that for his people. So, you know, it's good that we're here and gather together on the gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ. Pray and trust that he'll grow us and he'll grow his people as it pleases him. He'll grow his pastor, you know, and, and we'll grow together. And we just rejoice in what the Lord has done. And I'm thankful for that. So, all right, let's pray. Our gracious Lord, we thank you for your mercy and your grace in giving us life from the dead. Lord, even as you raised up Lazarus, Lord, so you raised us gave us life in yourself. We're thankful for that, Lord. For we know you've shown us that we can do no good thing in this flesh. Lord, keep us looking to Christ. Keep us rejoicing in him and trusting him. Lord, help us we need to be patient and loving to one another and to serve one another gladly. We pray this in Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior.